I will be talking about the disappearing polymath and if one field of knowledge is really enough. So, um, I've got a lot of people asking me what a polymath is. So a polymath is someone who has the ability or curiosity to master and collect expertise in many different di disciplines, um, areas, etc. So that basically means that even you may be an expert in one discipline, but you have key insights from many other ones. So, um, to start out, I'd like to um, go with a little bit of uh, analogy. So, if you imagine now the kind of um, mathematician or programmer that's in your head, you know, the stereotype, the guy sitting at your desk, um, typing away at the computer, writing equations, but then someone comes up and starts talking to them, and they start applying the same rules that we're using for the equations to um, the social interaction. So, if you imagine anyone here a fan of Big Bang Theory? Yeah, yes, someone. Um, so, if you remember Sheldon, he's that exact stereotype, right? He, and this makes the show absolutely hilarious um, because of all the situations. But it's a really good example of where someone has only one way of thinking about things, or one way of interacting with the world, and how this doesn't really work so much. Um, so, um, a ni nice quote to illustrate is that to a man with only a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So, when you have only one way of thinking about things, you cannot escape that one way of thinking. Now, on the contrary, is something that is shown as the kind of T-shaped individual. This is a slide from IBM. Um, they have their special worker, which is an expert in one field, but also <coughs> understands things from many other ones. And the example that I like of this is this man called Charlie Munger, who is one of the most successful people. He's one of the 1800 richest people in the world, but apart from being a successful businessman, he also writes Bill Gates about uh, mating patterns of naked mole rats. Now, maybe business and naked mole rats doesn't, there isn't a precise connection there, but it shows the kind of way he approaches problems and his openness to these different things. So, what he developed is um, what's called the two-track analysis. Now, he uses this um, to model customers. Now, and he combines knowledge from economics in the one track, where he thinks of the person as the one who, as someone who's really weighed their decision really well. So they've taken the two products they want to buy, and they've compared every little bit of it. And at the end, compare the price. So how fast you can go, if you're comparing the cards, how fast you can go, how, how much horsepower, and how quickly can it start up. So um, that's the first track, the one that's very rational about their decisions. But also, not very many people actually act like this. So the second track is where this comes in, where he combines psychology with neuroscience and develops um, the person as someone who has different biases. So someone who is prone to advertising, someone who grew up in a certain way. And, he can, and there he can get a better understanding of who the person really is by combining both of these. Now, this both makes him understand his customers better, but also it makes him understand his friends. So if you've ever been in that social interaction where you start talking to someone, you introduce yourself, say, hey, I'm doing this, and I'm, I study this, and then they say something like, oh, I study contemporary dance. And then you kind of look at them, and you don't know what to say, and they don't know what to say because they don't know anything about electronics or something, and there's kind of this wall, you're stuck. Um, but if you did know something about, say, martial arts, say, capoeira, which is a um, martial art that looks a lot like a dance, and it's made to. So then you could start talking about that, and then they could start talking about the dances um, that are similar to that style, and then you would start a conversation going. But the key bit there is that you have to understand a little bit of something at least somewhat similar to what they're doing, and it lets you kind of unstick as we flow into the conversation. And similarly, if you want to understand the person better, 
you have to understand who they are in terms of what they are doing. So if they are a dancer, if you start doing dance, you may actually understand them better themselves. So being a polymath means all of these things. But <clears throat> what I want to go on is some of different ways that this has been used in different times. So on the left side is Pythagoras, who is, by the way, also very well known for his cult and his religion. Um, in the middle is Newton's alchemical manuscript, which is now considered magic, and um, like much of physics. And um, on the right is Adam Smith, um, who, apart from founding modern economics, um, has also wrote extensively on political philosophy. So these people have been around for a while, and this is kind of a way of, under, uh, of approaching the world that has been here um, since the very beginnings of our history, but never really been considered by the mainstream society. What connects all of these people across the times, apart from being polymath, but the way they approach problems, and mo most importantly, their sense of wonder. When you see a turtle walking on the beach, um, you may just walk by, oh hey, turtle. Um, and, and then just move on with your life. But what you can also do is start thinking about the turtle guy. He's like, oh, where is he going? How long has he been, how long has he been here? Why are there so many of them? Or, oh, he still has to cross 15,000 kilometers to get to the next place he needs to be. And that both makes him very, a lot more interesting, but it also enhances you, because then you, you are enjoying the experience so much better than you were before um, by just walking down the beach. So I think at the core of this is the importance of kind of wonder. But since we are students, we wonder about different things, say, um, and most importantly for us, learning. And taking more on more disciplines can mean that you yourself will enhance what's called the mindset towards your learning. There are these two things called a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So a fixed mindset is usually that, um, such that when you see a problem, it's like, oh, it's someone trying to testing, test me again. Oh, it's some, um, I have to do work now. I have to do something now. And oftentimes people think, um, especially if it's a hard problem, I can't do this. Or I'm not good for this. I'm not good enough. And maths is a really good example. But the way to overcome this is what's called the growth mindset, where you take it, yes, another problem, and you say, yes, another challenge. And this is developed through, through facing this kind of um, mindset again and again and again. If you are stuck with enough problems, um, not at the same time, but eventually you, you work through several problems, then then you actually figure out, actually, since I could do that, I could probably do this again too. Or you think, hey, I've, I've already achieved that. I'll be able to achieve this too. And it kind of carries over um, and allows you to overcome all of these problems that you may or may not face, um, especially during your studies. So actually, taking on different problems can <coughs> allow you to uh, change the way you look at the problems that you're facing now. Um, also, it, <coughs> Apart from making a lot of the things more interesting, because you're exploring new things, that's cool. Um, but what I'd like to also talk about is something that gets thrown on quite a lot now, um, and that is something about um, creativity. So by understanding more things, um, you become essentially more creative, because creativity always needs some kind of input. That's why artists like, um, talk about what inspired them so much. Now, if you're a polymath and you understand more different, um, different fields, then you, you have both more of those little prompts, but you can also connect those little prompts in many different ways. And that's essentially the essence of creativity, isn't it? Another thing 
that gets, <coughs> gets talked about a lot is rationality, where weighing your decisions in the right way. And of course, having more fields, you can weigh a, a, something from many different angles and understand it from many different bearings. But the one that I really wanted to talk about is the part of meaning. And that is, um, a lot of us even coming here aren't really sure of what we want to do. And we don't know where this will lead us, where this will take us. But the important part is really exploring and seeing where we can go, right? It's, but absolutely central to this idea is um, going out there and trying new things and becoming, even though it's not part of what you're doing right now, may be helpful later on. Or you, you might actually find that you enjoy something more than um, what you're doing right now. And that can help you so much to produce actual meaning within your life. So I've given you some reasons, or some ways that I've thought of this. Um, but now you might say, how do I become this? How do I, how do I start? But um, I'm not, not going to give you a field manual or anything. But I do have a few things that, <coughs> that may help. And the first thing is that that beginning is hard. And especially this kind of first setback when you see, say, oh, hey, I want to learn juggling. And that guy comes around and he's throwing five balls. And you're just sat there with two and can't juggle those. Um, you just, you're kind of prone to give up at that point. You're just like, well, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I don't want to do this. But overcoming that is really what defines um, being a polymath and being able to um, go against these kind of psychological barriers there. O overcoming these kind of barriers and go doing it over, over and over again um, despite it being hard. Um, how you do this is you kind of have to just stop and listen. Like actually be there. Like, if you take a juggling class, um, and you kind of keep throwing the ball up and down in one end, you're probably not going to learn much. You have to really be there. You have to be listening to the guy. You have to play with the balls. You have to um, really interact with what you're doing. So that's the first step. Even, and if you go on, this may become even a hobby. Um, this may be something you do, oftentimes. Or, even better, what I like is the kind of 30-day challenges, where you repeat something, for 30 days, you keep doing it 10, 20, 30 minutes a day, and then you, um, and then you actually become good at it. You see what it's like and choose if, oh, actually, I want to continue with that or not. And um, last week, you just need to explore, really. Like, go out there and see all those things. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>